entering his 35th year as the head coach at his alma mater, DePaul's Doug Bruno, the head coach of the reigning Big East champion, DePaul Blue Demons, joining us. And then we're heading to the metropolitan area. St. John's head coach, Joe Tartamella, and Seton Hall head coach, Tony Bazella. If you watched Big East women's basketball last year, you caught them in the all-access game once again on Fox Sports. So we will take your questions. Just raise your hand. Remember to state your media affiliation once we get going. I know we've got Joe. There's Tony. <laughs> and we have Doug coming in in just a moment. Coaches, thanks for taking the time. It's good to see everybody. How are we doing? Excellent, Coach. Excellent. Nice to see you, John. Very good to see you as well. Uh, I think Doug should be here in a moment, but you know, we'll, we'll just get started here while we're waiting for some questions to come in. Um, Tony and Joe, uh, I'll start with you, Joe. The state of this conference, and, and you know the parity that's within it, now UConn back in the Big East, obviously a powerhouse. You know, What do you make of coaching in this league and the competition within it? Yeah, listen, I mean, uh, you're talking to someone who's spent uh, uh, f from the age of 22 on now to 41 in, in this league. So uh, it's been always a pleasure to be a part of it and to be able to, to be a young coach growing up in it. Um, there was nothing better to be able to learn from and watch some of the, the best coaches that have ever done it, um, Hall of Famers. And now being able to, uh, to be a part of our new look and then adding UConn back, I think we've only strengthened – uh, what was already, I think, a strong and underrated conference in the country. So to me, and, and I think to a lot of our coaches in the league, uh, we're really uh, we're really excited about the opportunity and, and what our future holds. Um, and, and I think everyone's going to see that as we start the uh, as we start the year. You know, Tony, when you think about the history of this league, when I I've talked to you in the past as a student at Seton Hall, you were watching great players from the Big East inside. Walsh Jim, and, and now continuing on at your alma mater as the head coach of Seton Hall women's basketball. And obviously uh, you played UConn on FS1 last year to, to what was a very entertaining game. What do you make of coaching in this league and what do you see in it? Well, I mean, even before Connecticut got here, John, we, we, we the one thing that I think separates the Big East from a lot of conferences is we have all veteran coaches who've coached a long time um, that are very talented. And now I've added, uh, um, some new younger talented head coaches in, in um, Mel and Megan. Um, it's a really hard league. Um, it's, it's, you're not going to find, you know, 11 better coaches in the country. Um, even at the power five schools, they've hired a lot of um, inexperienced coaches to take those jobs. And you can see why they're not as, you know, successful as our league is. Um, our coaching are, are tremendous. Obviously adding Connecticut with their tremendous staff is not going to make things any easier. Both of you have veteran talent that's on the All Big East preseason team. Tony, I'll begin with you. What is it like and what's it been like to watch Desiree Elmore evolve as a player? And what do you expect from her as a senior? Well, I'm really proud of Des. She's gotten herself in tremendous shape. Um, when she came here, she wasn't nowhere near the shape that she is now. She's been very dedicated. Um, this is the most I've seen Des put into her game. Um, so I'm really proud of her for that because she's – put a lot into her game before and she continues to get better um and we need her to play really well we need her to play like a first team all-conference player for us to um you know hopefully be successful um it's just going to be you know it's just a hard league and there's a lot of good players so for her to be listed as a first teamer shows the ability that she has and respect she has from the other coaches in our league joe there's another senior in this league uh out of the many you have one of the stars as well in kadasha hathi uh, what's it been like just coaching her? I, I know that her impact on your program not only happens on the floor, but extends beyond it. Yeah, listen, I mean, it's uh, I've watched Q probably since she was in seventh grade. So to watch her development has probably been the most exciting part. Um, and then having the opportunity to coach her uh, over the last three years uh, during her college career and, and obviously moving into her senior year. Um, she, she's just so humble. Um, I, I think her leadership is now really shining um, in what's become, in a way, her team. 
uh, in many ways. And she shows that every day in practice with uh, the energy that she brings, the communication she brings to our younger players and um, really happy. And, and, you know, for her that she's being recognized, obviously in the preseason, she knows she needs to obviously perform during the season to um, finish on that team as well. But I think when you look at her scoring ability, what she's done and she's improved her game, I think in all areas, and she's really tried to become a better defender, uh, you know, over her time here. Uh, but I mean, if you look at her numbers, I, I think I saw something today where she was the active leading scorer in the big East um, as, as it stands today, which I did not know uh, thanks to our sports information department, but, uh, but something obviously that we're proud of for her and, and, and really, you know, as good as she is on the court, she's even better off the court and, and leading our team and in, in what we're seeing around the country and the things that we're talking about every day, um, whether it be social injustice or voting and things that are current events, she's been uh, a spearhead for us. Um, someone I can rely on, someone I can talk to. And, and we've had some great conversations over the years. And, and so I'm really excited about her, her senior year. I think the first time I met our first question asker was at a St. John Seton Hall game. You two know him too well. It's Doug Feinberg from the Associated Press that leads us off. Doug. Fellas, good to see you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Doug. So my question for both of you, I mean, you're both New York area guys. With the whole mess that's been here for the last seven months with the COVID pandemic, there's so much uncertainty for the season. And coaches yesterday were saying there's the cliche of sort of uh, living day to day is what coaches tend to preach, but it really seems apropos right now because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So how are you guys dealing with this pandemic day to day with getting your teams to focus on, Hey, we may not have practice tomorrow because you don't know what's going to happen. So how do you deal with what, what's been going on in this, in the, the country and specifically in the New York area to get you guys to focus on the day to day versus like, we have a game in a week, or we have a game two weeks, or a game in a month from now. Start with Tony. Yeah, you know, Doug, we're, we're just we're practicing at, like like as normal as we can go. We just we practice, we put our stuff in like we normally would, you know, game, you know, day by day as you know, in, it relates to our first game schedule for November twenty fifth. And um, if we have to make an adjustment, we're going to make an adjustment. You know, I'm not going to get too complicated with this. You know, I, I've never mentioned to the girls that we aren't going to play. Um, I tell, take care of yourself, pray, um, and, 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 and hope we play. Um, you know, I, I, that's all we do. We're just going to not make long discussions about it. We tell them to take care of themselves, and we just practice, and we do the best we can. Yeah, I think, you know, Doug, it's, uh, it's a constant uh, communication each day as to maintaining uh, – the protocols that we need to do. I'm proud of our university and how we've been able to, I think, handle the, the protocols and, and the things that we have in place to do the best job we can to stay safe. And, and we preach as much as we can um, as to being safe when they, they leave our building. And I think, um, you know, again, our staff has done a great job. I think our university has done a great job in putting those protocols in place. Um, and, and we're going to do the best we can. But as Tony said, Certainly, we try to make it as normal as possible in, in, in how we practice and, and, and how we operate from day to day. Um, it's, we have to be the most flexible um, that we've ever been, I think, uh, in, in how we do things. And, and so, um, you know, I, I, again, I think knowing that we have a lot of things in place that have, that have, uh, that have been there to keep us safe and keep us up and running, uh, we feel pretty good about where we are, again, knocking on wood. Um, you know, as, as we, as we move into the end of the week, but um, you know, obviously we feel confident that we'll be able to do those things moving forward. We do welcome in DePaul head coach, Doug Bruno. Uh, Doug, it's very good to see you. And we had a question come in from a uh, man, you, you know, well, the Associated Press is Doug Feinberg. Doug, I, I do Doug Feinberg. I want you uh, to have the chance to ask coach Bruno the question. Doug, number one, good to see you, my friend. Um, just the same question I asked Joe and, and Tony coaches like to have control and sort of live uh, day by day. And this virus has made it. You have to live day by day. How are you guys dealing with that out in Chicago with the team, like focusing more just, Hey, let's get to the next day as opposed to looking forward to the future, so to speak. I've just been very, very impressed with our players. Uh, they've been just doing a great, great job of, of managing 
they come to practice every day with a great fire up attitude that, that I, I hear around the country. You know, I ask them, you know, if people talk about mental health, people talk about mental health. I ask my players, are you okay? And, and, and yet it's just amazing the resiliency. I'm just so proud of them. I don't know what I could, I, I, don't, I couldn't have been a college student that had to go back to my room every day and just be in my room. So I'm just really, really impressed with what they're doing every day and impressed with our players. And, and I think we you know, generally live in a day-to-day, moment-by-moment experience, but you know, I, I just am really proud of our players. The energy they're bringing to practice has been off the charts. And I'm just really, um, really thrilled by that. And I apologize for not being on here on time, y'all. Um, usually I own up to my own hookups, but today um, this wasn't mine. We will uh, continue, and as we have questions come in, please state your name, your media affiliation as well. So we'll go to Dama Mori. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, coaches. Uh, Dama Mori from the Hartford Current. Uh, this is for Tony. Uh, John stole my thunder a little bit at the beginning, but I want to ask a Desiree Elmore question. Uh, Tony, can you just uh, tell me, what have you learned about her uh, since you, you've been coaching her? What maybe were your perceptions going in, and, and any of the, anything surprised you about her? As, as a person, as a student, her personality, as a teammate, you know, et cetera? You know, I, 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 it's a great question, Dom. You know, Des is one of my favorite kids I've ever coached. So I really like Des. She's got a great personality, tremendous smile. She's one of the more intelligent players I've coached. But watching her in high school, I thought she wasn't in great shape. She took a lot of plays off. Her talent got her to where she was. Um, when she transferred in from Syracuse, she had – you know, struggled for the two years there, both on and off the court. So I wasn't sure who I was going to get, but the three years here have been amazing. Um, she works hard. She's uh, done tremendously in the classroom, especially the past year and a half. Um, she's going to graduate at the end of the year with a great degree. Um, but she's a smart player. She's a competitor. Um, she's really grown into – um, the player that she is now by getting herself in tremendous shape. Um, and, and she's fun to be around. I really like her. She has a great, great smile. She comes in and says hello to me every morning. Um, it, it, it's nice. She's, I, you know, she's a really nice person and, uh, and a really you know, good kid who I think is really comfortable right now where she is. And I think that's really helped her become a better player. What do you think her future is beyond basketball? I think Des could be a great coach. She knows the game so well. Um, I, I, I think she's so intelligent. She sees the next play ahead. So I think if that's something she wanted to do, um, she could be successful. But I also think, you know, in the business world, I mean, she's a bright, sharp person who um, could do a real great job in the business world as, as a leader. And we need women leaders in this, in this world, but certainly in the business world. I think she could be very successful there as well. Thank you, Don. We'll take our next question from Lois Elfman. Hi, this is Lois Elfman from the New York Amsterdam News. I have a two-part question. The first, uh, to touch on something Coach Bruno said, are your players really just going back to their rooms uh, after training and whatever on-campus activity they may have in terms of their schooling, although I imagine many of their classes are online? How much are they allowed to go out and about, and how much are they really taking this so seriously to uh, what was the words we were all using, like station in place? Uh, how much are they out in the world and how much are they really just going to their rooms? Joe, we'll start with you. Yeah, hey, Lois, how you doing? Um, you know, yeah, I think um, for us, we're in a little bit of a hybrid mode. So there's certain days where they're going. I have certain players that are in a class maybe once uh, or, or one in, in-person class class uh, once a week and then the rest are online. So a lot of them, um, a lot of them actually taking an opportunity so that they're not sitting in their room all the time is to be able to use study hall as a place where they can go and be able to get some work done. So they don't feel like they're, they're not really in school, which is a different feeling as, as every coach has said. So, um, you know, I think our players are also doing a great job of, of handling the situation and, and being as smart as they can be. Um, am I within 24 hours a day? Absolutely not. Uh, all we can do is hope that we can educate them on, on the things that they need to do in order to make sure that they're uh, able to attend classes to go to school and also to be on the floor, you know, and I think that's the, the, the mentality that we've had. Um, 
So we've got a little bit of a mixture as far as what they're doing with class and um, as far as them staying safe. So hopefully, again, knock on wood, we've been we've been pretty good there and 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 continuing hopefully moving into the season. Tony, oh, Lois, great to hear from you, and uh, thank you for all your great coverage in the answer Amsterdam. You know, we're doing everything we can. Our school has has put forth some tremendous guidelines, has made things very accessible for our, our student athletes to still have a life, but also make things as safe as possible. At the end of the day, to be honest with you, we're doing everything we can, but that doesn't guarantee anything. I mean, I look at all these pro athletes, I look at some of these other colleges that have shut down. Those kids are doing everything as well, but the virus doesn't hide. The virus doesn't say, well, when you do something bad, we're gonna get you. It just is there. So we've got to hope and we've got to pray our kids want to play basketball. That's the one thing I will say about this group. They will want to play. I'm really proud of them for that. And they're doing everything they can in their power to stay safe. Hopefully that's enough. Doug. Yeah, yeah. We're not with our players 24 seven. So we just, we implore, we beseech, we teach, we preach. The, the, the three simple solutions are our COVID discipline to stay safe, to stay safe socially distance, to wash your hands, scrub your hands, wear masks. And, you know, but we're not with them every day and we're not with them 24 seven and, and, and they are human beings. And there's no such thing as a partial bubble. A partial bubble is water. So you, you don't have a partial bubble. I, I, get, I get excited, I interested when I hear people talk about these partial bubbles. There is no such thing. So or, you know, I referenced our players just going back to their rooms. I'm sure they're doing other things but I, I just trust that they're doing anything else that they're doing in, in a really, really responsible manner. And, and I've just been impressed by the responsibility which our athletes have shown under these circumstances. But again, we're, we're not with them 24 seven. So I, I would just hope that they are doing something socially safe besides just going to the room, but just still have to figure out what does that mean? How can you be by yourself? How can you, not just go out to all the great, you know, there's just a, a great social life right here in Lincoln Park where DePaul's located is one of the highest COVID uh, places in Chicago because it's young people between the ages of, of 18 and, and 30 are, that are all out and they're not paying attention to the, to the discipline that they need to pay attention to. So our players are here in this environment. And I really have been impressed with how disciplined our own players have been, but we're not with them 24 seven and they are between 18 and 22. And, and so I just have to trust them and keep preaching. We'll take our next question from Howard Magdal. Yes, hi gentlemen, Howard Magdal with the next. It's good to chat with, uh, with each of you. Um, I'm hoping you to take this each in turn. Um, you guys have all played significant out-of-conference schedules with uh, challenges throughout. You've been top 50 routinely uh, by just about any of the metrics in terms of the difficulty, if not considerably higher. I just wonder with UConn's presence in the conference, how that's changed the way you think of it if it alters the balance, if it makes things easier as you figure out what a schedule needs to look like to get you to where you need to go, uh, and, and if that's altered, you're thinking even over the next couple of years as you put this together. We'll lead off with Doug. I, I really believe that, and I, I've said this often, and maybe I'm repeating myself too often, but I believe UConn is the best program in the history of all college basketball, and I'm old enough to have got, watched very closely to Coach Wooden teams of the 60s and, and 70s. So that said, this is the absolute best program and it's absolutely going to lift us. And at the same time, I still think you can't, I think, I still think you have to play a tough schedule to get specific to your question. I still think you have to play a tough non-conference schedule, even knowing that, that you're, you're gonna come up against a really, really difficult opponent. In, in the Big East with UConn. And again, Joe is part of this. Tony, you, were, you weren't with the old Big East, but T Joe was. And in the old Big East, you had not only UConn, but you had four and five and six ranked teams in January and February. And Jim Crowley said it earlier, uh, this Big East since realignment has been 
as tough as the old Big East. It just didn't get the, it hasn't gotten the recognition. So you got UConn. I still think you got to play great people non-conference. But I'm sitting here looking at Tony here with his with his arms behind his back, and I'm thinking, oh, I mean, but for a, a possession or two, they're in the championship game last year, not us, and they've been very, very difficult to play against, as has been Joe St. John's team and every team in this league. So it's a great league. UConn is going to make it much better, and at the same time, I think non-conference, we can't just soften it up now because we're counting the two, uh, two games that we're going to be playing against UConn, so now – decrease the non-conference schedule. I think the non-conference has still got to be really, really difficult. Tony? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think what makes our league so difficult, Howard, too, is a lot, well, these most, except for the Pac-12, the other Power 5 conferences all play each other usually only once. We play each other twice, a lot of times three times. That makes it's so much harder because there's adjustments made. You're playing on the opponent's uh, away um, uh, uh, opponent's floor all in every time you play them. If you're in the SEC, the Big Ten, the ACC, you might only get those teams once, and you get them at home. We get everyone twice. So that makes our league so much tougher. Now you're adding UConn to play twice. With that being said, it's going to be hard to win our tournament, Howard. It really is. So you damn well better have a good non-league schedule so you can get in that large bid. And if you ask me something that worries me about this year, it's this year. Like, we have a good non-league schedule. It's not as, you know, robust as it's been in the past because we can't travel. We've stayed local so we can make sure we play these games. We've stayed with um, programs that are going to hopefully have the same testing protocols as us. So this year will be a challenge. But to answer your question, we have to play a hard non-league schedule because that will, A, help us with the not large, and B, prepare us for our league, which is so hard because we play everyone twice. Yeah, Howard, I think uh, everything that's been said, I, I think we're all on the same line of thinking. Um, and, and as Doug mentioned, I mean, even going back years when I first started of, of the, the rigors of what it was and, and even what it is now, you, you have to be prepared, as both coaches have said. You have to you know, put your team in positions that might be uncomfortable in places that are hard to play because you're going to be in that uh, situation, whether it uh, it comes down during the regular season or in the postseason at the tournament. And, um, and, and if you don't schedule that way, you're giving your team and your players that you're telling, you're getting them prepared for the postseason. You're giving them less of an opportunity to be able to have some signature wins, to be able to get the RPI up of not just your own program, but the league. And I think that's a big part just for the league in general, for, for the Big East. I mean, it's an important part of what we do because we're beating each other up, you know, during the, during the conference uh, uh, schedule it's really important that we come into that conference schedule with, with some robust RPI so that we're not hurting each other um, and, and kind of in a way almost uh, cannibalizing each other as we're trying to be able to get to the postseason. Um, and if you're lucky enough and, and we were in 12, when you get a chance and you have a chance and you get to beat UConn, it, that, that helps you a lot. But even playing them helps you, you know, uh, push yourself up in that RPI. But I think, as Doug said, um, and mentioning Coach Crowley's point of, kind of what I mentioned. I think we've been underrated as a league period without UConn. So to add them obviously helps us out, but it doesn't change the way that you, you should schedule. I don't think, or in my mind, at least, because it's something we've always prided ourselves on and, and making sure that we've uh, we've challenged ourselves. We've prepared ourselves um, and, and our players are then ready for the, for the conference season. Our next question is from Matt DeMarinis. Thanks, John. Hey, uh, Joe, I just had a question for you about Leilani Correa. And, uh, um, you know, it's kind of interesting because you, you look out and she was clearly like playing like one of the best freshmen in the country, especially at the end of the year. If not for Maddie, I mean, she's the clear freshman of the year in the league last year. And I was just, you know, you look at the last, you know, four last five games, over 20 points per game, really efficient, um, big time player for you. I just wondered how much of that momentum have you guys been able to harness in terms of carrying that over for a year or two, despite the, obviously the interruption and the extended off season? I mean, obviously, <laughs> Leilani had a special year, especially as a young player for a kid who really wasn't even with us in the summer. So to do what she did, especially toward the end of the year where she was, um, you know, certainly we're really pleased with how she performed. Uh, 
you know, and, and for her, I mean, just you, you look at the way she was able to score last year, whether it be in the league or out of the league uh, with three 30 point games, um, really just still as a younger player, though, you're still talking about consistency and, and how you show up and how you how you're preparing yourself. I think she's got a better idea of all those things now coming into the year. Um, the way she was able to perform in the Big East tournament as a freshman for us and, you know, an all tournament team player as a freshman. I don't think we've ever had that. Um, so to see her perform in those big moments, I think was really important to see uh, for her growth as she got through the year and somebody who honestly probably could have started at every game. Um, and she was very, very modest and, and wanted to do what was best for a team and being able to be that first one off the bench, which got her that, you know, six woman of the year award probably, but a, a kid who really, again, is selfless in many ways. Um, and to watch her now, you know, again, continuing to build up her body, continue to build up her mental uh, side and mental approach to the game. Um, really exciting to be able to see what she's going to do. But, yeah, she's been um, she's been terrific, obviously, as we've gotten out there to start and, and certainly will be a big piece to what we do through the year. We'll take our next one from Andrew Lipton. Thanks, John. Um, uh, Andrew Lipton, a Wim Hoops guru in AL Films. Uh, the question is for Joe. Uh, Joe, um, good to see you again. Um, really, uh, two questions. One is just to follow up on, on some of your thoughts about Lilani um, in terms of what you said. Um, you said she's working on um, kind of building up a mental approach, learning how to show up. Um, you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, just in the fact of like as a younger player, I think sometimes they, they uh, sometimes we get caught up with hitting a wall a little bit. They haven't played that many games, you know, taking care of their body, knowing what that means, knowing what it means to work in the weight room. Uh, as younger players, a lot of times we, they, you know, we don't understand that. And so now with a, a year under her belt, um, kind of fine tuning those things physically, uh, being ferocious with film, uh, being ferocious with getting her shots up, getting extra work in. Um, you know, filling in, you know, filling in gaps maybe that were there last year. And, uh, and certainly for her, I've challenged her to be a better defender because I know she can be. So certain things like that where I think we're going to see improvement and obviously to be able to do the things she had been doing. And, and certainly it's, it's good when no one knows who you are for a little bit. And then obviously you become a target. So you've got to be able to navigate that as well as you get, in, as you get older and as you become a veteran player. So that part of, of the mental side is probably where is, is what I'm talking about physically knowing uh, what the demands will be of her body, you know, over time and the amount of games we're playing this year, obviously is, is a little bit different. Right. So, um, you know, she's trying to get through that as well, but, uh, but really pleased with, with her progress so far. Thanks. And, and the other question is um, who's going to run the team on the floor this year and how's that going in practice so far? Yeah, listen, I mean, obviously we have a hole with the loss of Tiana, but uh you know, I think we've got some some younger players. We've got a player who's sitting out. So between Unique Drake and and uh, Camry Clegg, we're hoping that uh, those two guys will fill that void in some manner. Um, and they've done well. I mean, obviously, a um, little different type of player than Tiana was. But uh, certainly the next person's got to step up to be able to do it. And um, I'm pretty pleased with where they are as well um, in, in where we stand here, whatever number of practices in. We'll take our next question from Alexa Philippou. Hi coaches, this is Alexa Philippou from the Hartford Current. Good to see you all. Um, there's been a lot of talk really starting yesterday with the men's side just about how to maybe avoid um, the likelihood of having disruptions in the season and the schedule. Some coaches were um, very much in support of a bubble, um, moving to a bubble format even for regular season games. Some coaches um, wanted the NCAA and maybe the Big East to look at um, the guidelines around a 14-day quarantine period for those who might have had high-risk exposure to COVID, um, you know, within the program. But as um, Commissioner Ackerman said to us recently, a lot of that's also at the hands of um, of the local health officials. So I'm just kind of curious where your what your thoughts are on those two aspects, and um, you know what the league can do to try and um, make the season happen smoothly and as safely as possible. We'll start with Doug. The bubble would be great. And yet the bubble that was created by the NBA and the WNBA was just such a, a unique and special environment and, and great lengths, great, great expense. And, and to be able to create a bubble like that, I, I just, I think it can happen for sure, but it's gonna to have to happen in smaller windows. 
as I said earlier, there's no such thing as a partial bubble. You know, you're going to bubble, you have to bubble. And, and that means tighten everything up. And I think it could happen in shorter windows, two weeks to three week windows. Tony put together a great proposal that we presented to the league. The league's been working very, very hard to look at the possibility of bubbles. And, and, and yet, I don't know that it's as realistic as, as what the NBA and the WNBA were able to put together for just a, a number of reasons. So that said, then on the, on the subject of the 14 day quarantine, I just think we have to be safe. And uh, if the doctors, if, if we can be safe testing out of a, of a, of a positive or, or with a positive test, where the person is actually testing negative again, as long as it's, we're gonna be safe with it, I, I, I'm fine shortening the, the quarantine from 14 days. But again, I'm gonna I'm gonna to defer to doctors on that, and and just being on the COVID nineteen working force task force call with the Big East is amazing. Um, I, I, and to the doctors' credit, if, if you could ask, if you could cut the doctors' heads open, we wouldn't be playing. We wouldn't be playing at all. And I I, I don't think we're gonna be on a call in a few minutes after this is over with. And if they're listening, I don't know that they are. But they, we wouldn't be playing if we we're just listening to the doctors. And I say that with all affection for the doctors and what they have to do. But at the same time. Yeah, there's more to this, and, and, and we all do want to play. The players want to play. Coaches want to play. Now we just have to make sure we ensure safety the best we can. Tony. I mean, as Alexa knows, I, I had a long talk with her the other day about this. And uh, the one thing I'll, I'll start with is I have tremendous confidence in the leadership of the Big East. Um, we have a tremendous commissioner who I know is putting forth our players our coaches and the staff safety first. There's no question. And I don't envy her job at all because it's very difficult. I will say this, there's no way we're going to be able to play with this 14 day quarantine. It's just not going to happen. It's someone's going to get sick at some point and then to shut your program down. It's not 14 days. It's closer to 20 days because 14 days of non-activity and you need five to four to six days of activity before you really can, physically play in a basketball game. So again, is this the Big East issue? No, absolutely not. This is an NCAA issue. And I don't. I, I have asked this question to everyone and I still don't get an answer. How is football able to test out and we're not able to test out in basketball? I don't know that answer. Maybe there's answers, but one day we're gonna find out. But until we figure this part out, this is going to be a very disruptive season. Which again goes to my word of two week bubbles to protect the kids, the staffs and the people. And I've said this numerous times. I don't want to take up a lot of time, but you know, like I said, I have tremendous confidence in the Big East leadership that they're going to put us in the best position to be safe. Um, so unfortunately, some of this is out of their control. Joe. Yeah, can, can you just repeat your question again? I'm sorry. No, okay. Sorry, I was um, sorry, I was muted, but I'm unmuted now. Um, basically, my question was, what if you had any personal kind of thoughts or preferences about um, trying to maybe play league regular season games in a bubble? Um, and I said that some coaches had expressed that they wanted the 14 day quarantine uh, period shorter, like such as what happened with Marquette, since they're now in that two week um, time frame where they are quarantined. But I know that is, you know, it is a little bit difficult with public health officials weighing in on that too. Yeah, I think for the sake of time, obviously, I think what, what both Doug and Tony are saying is, 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 is certainly the same sentiments that we all feel that, um, that we'll, we hope to be put in the best situation possible to be safe and to be able to play. And obviously, we're not doctors and, and, and obviously we have to defer to them at times. But as Tony said, um, and as some teams are going through, that 14 day stoppage is going to be very difficult to recover from in many ways uh, if you cannot test out. So um, certainly, there's a lot of questions on testing. There's a lot of questions on bubbles. There's all these things out there that, uh, that we don't have enough, I'm sure, time for or willingness to listen to, especially for me, because I'm not that smart. So, you know, to me, I think what both Doug and Tony said, I'm in, in the same line with uh, certainly we want to be safe and be able to play in whatever man, you know, in whatever manner that is and whatever we're told is safe uh, and, and is, is allowable, then that's what we're going to be for. Joe, Joe's not that smart to try to, try to score against his team. <laughs> uh, let's take our next question from Ashley Leotis. 
Hey guys, Ashley Laotis here uh, with the Big East. Coach Bruno, this one is for you. Uh, obviously a really strong finish to what ended up being the end of last season. We saw a lot from Lexi and Sonia, but what did you need to see from them in this bizarre off season? And did you see it or is there still room for growth for them? I, I think they're both getting every, uh, better every day as, as, as Tony alluded to talk about Desiree and as Joe talked about his, his Polani, they're, they're just getting better. I think that's what college basketball does experience. We can teach on the, on the, in the classroom. That's a court. We can teach in practice, but they have to get out there every day and they have to do it every day. And I think they're both, they both come back with a great approach. They're very improved, but we wish we could get ready to throw the ball up to see how that translates. Let's go next to Ralph Bednarczyk. Good morning, coaches. Uh, uh, Tony, Shadeen Samuels was, uh, was of course, such a great player, but uh, I, uh, especially, I think, uh, uh, tough to replace is what she was on your defensive end, uh, probably being your defensive MVP the last several years. Uh, what's it been like to try to uh, fill that void on that end and, and to find kind of the right personality uh, to, to be an anchor from that perspective? And, uh, and, and, and Joe, uh, how about you, Joe, your roster might be the, the biggest in terms of height and the most size you, you may ever have. Uh, have you seen that play out and, and uh, maybe how that might that impact uh, the way you guys play this year? We'll start with Tony. Ralph, great to see you. And um, just shows how much you know the game because you're right. Shadeen's defense was completely underrated. She's a tremendous defender. And honestly, we haven't, no idea how we're going to replace her right now. Um, it's been a big, it's our, probably our biggest question mark, our biggest issue. We're going to score points and we're going to go up and down the floor and we're going to get our pace better each day. But defensively is a big issue right now. Um, we need someone to step up. We need all four other five people to step up, to be honest with you. Not one person is going to replace Shadeen. We've got to be get better as team defense. And uh, we're trying and we're working on it every day. But this is, um, uh, uh, something that we have to work on and we have to get better at. We have to get tougher. We have to get mentally tougher. We have to get physically tougher. And we have to find a way to get five people to defend in the same way to make us a really good defensive team. And um, we're trying, but we're, we're not there yet. Joe? Hey, Ralph. Um, in regards to your question, yeah, certainly we, we feel like we have a little more depth there. Uh, certainly size doesn't always uh, – uh, equate in certain matchups, but, um, you know, we feel like we have some ability now with some more back to the basket players and some versatility to now have uh, guys who can stretch the floor um, in, in some ways as a uh, uh, stretch fours and a little more finesse posts, but also guys who now can power. And so um, we've been pleased with the development of, of those that were here. Um, and certainly we added two players that we think will help us a lot. Um, and so we're excited about seeing them as well. So um, but, but a lot will go into that as we, as we develop as a team and, and as we get to our matchups through the year. Thank you, Ralph. We'll take our final question on this panel from Erica Ayala. Thank you very much, coaches. This is Erica Ayala with the next newsletter. Uh, I've been asking all of the, the coaches in the Big East to reflect on ways that your specific coaching staff or you know program staff is being thoughtful and supportive of um, the athletes regarding the Big East um, commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and of course, the larger conversations about around racial and social justice happening, um, specifically in the United States. Doug? The, the racial situation in America is not something that just started this year. This has been going on this has been going on since the, the beginning of this country. So it's something that, that, that we have been here at DePaul trying to address from for, forever, not just this year. And at the same time, when you watch what has happened specifically on television, the way it's covered on television, and you see the national unrest unfold in front of you, the, the opportunities to speak. And, and everybody talks about tough conversations, but, but and, and we as coaches, 
we can elicit our players into conversations, but basically the tough conversations really, really have to come from them. And, you know, I think just we as coaches have to encourage it. And, and it's, a, it's, it's absolutely a great way to, to galvanize your team to be able to, it, when the players truly present tough conversations and the players truly react to those tough conversations, that's you, 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 you sit there and you watch your team actually coming together. And, 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 you know, it's not like we should have such a racially screwed up situation in this country to be able to have our players come together. But it is a situation that, yeah, and you asked the question, what are we doing, Erica? Well, we provide the platforms, but it's still, you know, watching these players come at each other in a constructive, strong, and respectful way, you know, th this is team building that you can't get out of any book. And it, it's just um, pretty impressive to watch. Tony. Erica, that's a wonderful question. Thank you for um, bringing that up. And, you know, I'm no expert at this. And that's one of the first things I said to our student athletes, but we're blessed here at Seton Hall with great resources. And um, Dr. Cooper has led those resources here and uh, she's helped our program. We've had numerous meetings, numerous opportunities for our kids to, to share their thoughts and to talk. Um, and, our, and our kids led by Desiree Elmore did their own um, peaceful meeting, peaceful group gathering right here at Seton Hall, which was very well attended. I was proud of Des and our team for doing that. Um, but the leadership here at Seton Hall has done a wonderful job, again, giving us the platform, giving us guidance, to help our student athletes. And like Doug said, this is going on for many, many years, well before this year. But I think right now we're getting our kids to, to understand, to speak up and to get a, an understanding of what we're doing and what is going on in today's society. I'm very proud of our program. We're all registered to vote. We're all going to vote. I think those things are big steps in, in getting change and getting us to be unified as a country. Yeah, along the same lines, I think, um, you know, especially now, I mean, we're, we're in a moment, you know, in time where athletes are using, you know, all their levels to use a platform to be able to speak out on the issues of social injustice, and it's nothing different here. And, and I think when you look at the league as, as a unifier and, and being able to wear the patch, uh, you know, the BLM patch that's going to support our athletes, you know, as they call for those sweeping changes in the country, I think that's something as, as a league that we've done, and, and we're proud of that as a league. I think as a university, the resources that we've provided, uh, we've had speakers, we've had, uh, you know, we have a rich history here too, and, and Joe Lapchick, who's one of our most famous coaches, uh, uh, who certainly uh, integrated uh, it, uh, the, the NBA, and his son Richard Lapchick is a huge speaker on social injustice, and has been for years, because he lived it. And to have those resources, to have those um, people who have lived it, to be able to talk to our players. Uh, and as Doug said, I mean, the, the conversations that they have have been so much more in depth and unifying, I think, in many ways. Um, and unfortunately, as he said as well, be, having something like this to have that happen, um, you know, but it's, uh, uh, it's amazing to see. And as I said, Q and uh, a lot of our players have, have led their own um, – their own projects in a way of, of, of having a t-shirt and, and, and kind of dedicating seven days of practice uh, uh, to, to, to one of the shooting victims that was uh, that happened out in the Midwest. So, I mean, you look at all the things that they're talking about that they're trying to, to build themselves um, along with being registered to vote and, and making sure they're going to vote to actually have an action plan, um, not just to talk about it. I think those are big things. And so um, certainly this is going to be an, uh, an everyday conversation. It's not going away. Um, but we're, we're not afraid to, to talk about it. We're not afraid to speak about it. Well, Joe, Tony, Doug, thank you so much for the time here.